Hello everybody, I'm Nick and I'm going to try and answer a question I get all the time whenever I'm talking about refactoring and I'm showing how I'm refactoring code and that is with all that refactoring and extract methods and dictionary so you don't violate uh, things like the open and close principle don't you degrade the performance of your software and whatever I'm going to talk about in this video applies to any high level language that is using a JIT compiler. I'm going to talk about what that is. So things like JavaScript, Python, obviously C Sharp and any .NET language or anything that runs the JVM, they all have this going for them. And I'm going to talk about what it is, how it works. Very high level though, I won't dive into the details. And I'm going to show you with benchmarks and real examples, how much performance do we lose by applying those principles if any. If you like that type of content and you want to see more, please subscribe, ring the notification bell so you don't miss any new videos. So let's go straight into the code. And what I have here is a couple of examples. We're going to start with the method extracting because I think that's the most prominent one, which I see all the time in my videos. And that is, you have a method like this, right? We have a data table where we have some clothing data in rows and columns. Um, and we statically initialize that. We don't really care about it. You can see the code is, it looks like this. It's only going to be initialized once for the application. And then we iterate over it. Those clothes uh, have a name, a material, and then a bunch of available colors. And we iterate over the colors to create individual SKUs, which is listings of that item in our website or e-commerce. And I'm using a deterministic randomizer for all of the examples, meaning that every time we rerun those tests, the same items will be generated to get a consistent memory use since the names will be the same every single time and the items. And that's very important when you want to have consistent benchmarks and very reliable benchmarks. So the code looks like this. And one of the things I talk about is not more than one level of indentation per method. And usually the way I fix it is that, okay, here I'm iterating over the colors to create the final name of the SKU and put it into the list of all the SKUs. So what I usually do is I'm just extracting that method and I'm saying pass all colors or just pass colors. And now we extracted it. We are at the top level of indentation. I can see what's going on there. And then the other thing I usually do uh, is I would also extract that and I would say something like, pause clothing data like this and then we have our two methods and people have asked okay you extracted this and you made two new methods and i know that in assembly this will create more operations and you effectively just shoot yourself in the foot because performance will be worse so what i want to do is i want to keep the original method as it was and then i'm gonna copy it and i'm gonna create a new one in that and I'm gonna call it extracted and I'm just gonna do the same extraction so pause colors and by the way this doesn't have to do with just this specific rule it has to do with method extracting in general it just makes it easy to understand what I'm doing that's why I'm using a clothing example in the forage loops this could be anything right anything that you want to give it a name that makes like logical sense to group together in a method and then this is pause clothing data, whatever. Um, and we have that, so I'm gonna delete that. And here I have a, a benchmark file where I can create benchmarks and also uh, check the memory that that benchmark is using. And the package that is running that is called uh, benchmark.net. We've made a video about this. You can check on the top right corner of your screen right now if you wanna get familiar with it. And I'm going to run my benchmarks using that, which will give very reliable results. What I want to do before I show you the extracted results as well, is I'm going to run this individual test where I just have the method that is all in one method. So we can get an initial place for where we are performance wise with this in memory operation. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. I'm going to give it a second because it runs uh, warm-up rounds and then actual workload rounds. So it can take, um, for a benchmark, it actually takes um, a few seconds, but when you have more, it does take more time. So let's give it some time to execute those tests and let's see what the operation looks like time-wise and memory-wise. So the results are back. And as you can see, the one method is completing in a mean time of 32.4 
microseconds. So one microsecond is one thousandth of a millisecond, uh, just so you have an idea of where we are. And we have 61.3 kilobytes of memory allocated. So this is pretty fast, you know, my, we're talking microseconds here, so everything is in a very microscopic scale. And what I want to do is I'm going to add the second benchmark. And the second benchmark is the extracted method. So extracted here, extracted here. And I'm going to execute the same benchmarks. And now let's see with the extracted method where we are calling two extra methods in that whole flow where we are performance wise. Let's give you some time to execute that. And once it's done, we're going to talk about it. And we have the results back and wait a second the extracted method is slightly faster than the one where everything is one method what's going on here now what's going on here will be very interesting if you're not familiar with something called the JIT compiler C sharp compiles to what is called bytecode or intermediate language IL and the CLR which is a VM that will run the code uh, and convert it to effectively machine code to run it has something during runtime called the JIT compiler where the instructions that we originally compiled will get recompiled during runtime and then optimized which means that things like those methods that I just created for reliability purposes will be effectively removed they will be optimized, cached and in some cases removed as well and this process is called inlining uh, the compiler will identify that these private methods are only used in this very specific place and they don't need to be called as separate uh, methods and they will be optimized to execute very, very fast. So the reason why you see this discrepancy minor where the extracted is faster is not that it actually is faster. It is that it's basically the same as, as far as the execution is concerned. Uh, maybe the first execution of the whole flow will be slightly slower, uh, but if it runs at least once, then everything will be optimized and it will be consistently the same performance as if you had it all in one method, but now it will be more readable. And, you know, if this is not more readable to you, that's absolutely fine. But there are other things, other cases where you might want to extract method and your concern is like, ooh, performance though, like I'm going to get a performance hit. It's not the case. And I can actually prove that it's not the case because C Sharp has a way for you to specify that you don't want something to be optimized by the JIT compiler. Um, you can use an attribute called method impl. And then there's two things, uh, two instructions you can give to the compiler and the, and the runtime. The no inlining, which talks about replacing the uh, method with the actual code without having to jump to a different function and also no optimization. So don't optimize this at all. And I'm going to apply that in both of my extracted methods. And now with those instructions in the methods, I'm gonna execute the same tests and let's see now what performance numbers we get. So our tests are finished now. And as you can see, we have a slight performance degradation here, um, but it's only 4.5 microseconds. This is so small, obviously it's just for two methods, but even if we didn't have the JIT compiler, yes, they would add up eventually, but the good thing is we have it. So performance is actually the same. Extract methods safely, don't worry about it. Extract them in logical pieces that make it easier for you to read and work with the code. Now, I wanna talk about something else while I'm here because Remember that this is a very isolated example. In a realistic application, you would actually be calling other things as well. You might have I.O. calls, whether that is networking or a file system, you know, your database calls, other APIs as well. So what I have here is a fake API. And this API has a single controller here where it has a 50 millisecond delay to try to imitate what an I.O. call to a different API would cost you. Now, 20 milliseconds for some is very high, for some is very low. I think it's in the middle of what it is acceptable from an external API to return in terms of SLAs. And now as part of every execution of that same test, I'm going to create um, a private uh, static read-only HTTP client. So we don't initialize it all over the place. Uh, and I'm going to actually 
define the base address and that will be a new URI. I don't want you to be nullable. Um, and I'm going to point it to localhost to that API that I'm going to run. And that is it. I can go here and just import it. Yada, yada, yada. And now as part of every execution of that uh, operation, I'm just going to add a fake, um, not a fake call. It's actually going to call the API, but we're not going to do anything with the data. So we're going to have to turn this to an async task list uh, because we want to use the await uh, call here, HTTP client dot get string async. So we're actually going to get the response as well, uh, which will also hurt performance a bit. Well, in a realistic scenario though, not artificially. And then I'm going to add the same call in the uh, method with the extracted items. And again, async task, uh, here we go. So, so now we have that. I would also need, I am suspecting to change the benchmarks. So let me update those as well. Yes, I should. So I'll wait here. And now we're going to run the unoptimized code through our benchmarks. So let's run those tests and see what the numbers look like now. Well, I actually need to start the API for that to work. So let me do that. Here we go. Right now I can run the tests. And now our tests are now done. And as you can see, the uh, extracted method is a bit slower than the uh, one method uh, operation. Now, let me run those tests again, and I'm going to explain why I'm going to run them again. So now the extracted method is faster after the second run. What does that mean? When it just means that the API happened to perform faster uh, the second time, and it's all within margin of error. There's no reliable results because you're going through the I.O., which means that whenever you're thinking about performing or well-performing code, Keep in mind that you're only as fast as your slower operation or your slowest operation, which means that you can write the most optimized code in the universe, but in a bigger scale where you have many requests, it all gets load leveled because the slowest thing can be disproportionately slower than what you just optimized. So be careful when you're working with code like this because you're wasting time even if it was one millisecond faster or two milliseconds faster or five consistently in the grand scheme of things the scale out of the operation in a stateless uh, microservice it is changing the number of pods that your kubernetes instance is running from four to five and you just instantly solve the problem and that is way cheaper than have a team of engineers prematurely optimizing code that doesn't need to be optimized now that first extraction method example covers one of the biggest arguments that I get, but I also want to address the second argument, which is the way I address open close violations. And I usually, when I uh, address them in my own code, I'm using a package called Mediator. Many of you are familiar with it. In case you're not familiar, Mediator is a package made by a very well-known developer of the community, which is implementing the Mediator pattern, which effectively says that give me a request, I'm gonna find which handler will handle this and give you a response back and you don't need to know anything about this. And this allows us to create handlers and queries and responses in a very decoupled way. Um, and it helps address the open closed principle violations. So I'm gonna go to um, the open closed folder. I'm gonna show you two things. First, I'm gonna show you this clothing service, which has the exact same code as the uh, previous example. The same SKUs iterate over and over, it's not extracted. And then here I have a handler, which is the mediator implementation. And in my main code, which is the mediator example, I'm initializing my mediator in my service. And in the mediator benchmark, I'm sending it to the mediator to give me back the result. While in the clothing service, I'm sending it directly to the service. And the, just so you know how it works, mediator internally has a dictionary um, of handlers. And after the first processing, it will actually cache the handler and will use um, the lifetime that you defined. I won't dive too much into implementation details, but just so you know, it's using a dictionary to select which handler will address that request. In C-Sharp, a dictionary is a hash table and it is uh, of O1 time complexity, or at least as, co as close to O1 as possible. Um, so I'm going now to change those benchmarks and I'm gonna add the uh, mediator ones. And I'm going to create another one, which is a, a direct call to the service. So service call benchmark. And I'm going to execute those 
things. Remember, one is using directly a class, the other one goes through a dictionary to the class. So let's run that benchmark and see where we are. So the results are back, and as you can see, Mediator is 1.3 microseconds slower, and it goes through a dictionary, and it's allocating 1.4 kilobytes more memory. Those numbers, for the benefit that you're getting, are so insignificant that we shouldn't even really be talking about any performance degradation. And keep in mind that Mediator using a dictionary, which is a hash table, which is a no one, will scale when you have more handlers. So you don't need to worry about having more handlers and causing you performance degradation because you're addressing an issue which is very important in a very elegant way, which is also very performant. That one microsecond that you're losing is within margin of error, so you shouldn't even worry about it. And remember, this is all within the context of a fully in-memory example that is not calling any other I.O. service, which is not realistic. In a realistic scenario, you'll call something. You'll call an API, you're going to call a database, you're going to call the file system, you're going to call something. So that differentiation, this, this small one microsecond difference, disappears in the real world. Absolutely disappears. I've never seen it being a problem. Whenever I'm optimizing my code, it's never anything that has to do with the application of clean code principles. It's always some SDK issue, some memory leak from code that I don't even own, which is within a package, um, or some, some other bizarre issue that nobody could have expected. So don't worry when you're writing code for languages like c -sharp, who is so well optimized, because the people who design those languages and build the VMs that those languages are running in are so smart and they have thought and optimized about all this. That's all I had for this video. I hope you learned something and I hope you learned that results and tests is actually what should drive those decisions and those discussions and not just speculation. Special thanks to my patrons for making this video possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.